Good morning and welcome to the WAP webinar on developing strategies for inclusive gender perspectives in PPPs. My name is Jean-Christophe Barbe and I'm co-founder and executive director of WAP, the World Association of PPP Units and Professionals, global home for public-private partnerships professionals. WAP encourages women PPP professionals with robust academic and practical skills to be recognized by their peers in the PPP industry. For more information, please refer to the WAP blog released on 19 September 2020. Uh, the, the address is wap.org, uh, and then you can find it on the blogs where we have created a peer-to-peer -peer recognition scheme. And we would like to have more women recognized as peer-to-PPP uh, peer professionals. Allow me to share rem uh, some remarks and technicalities uh, with you uh, and present the sequence of events in the next 90 minutes. Uh, we are going to record this webinar and it's going to be available uh, shortly after the webinar on our YouTube channel. Uh, we plan to finish this webinar at 12.30 uh, at today. Uh, with the chat function <clears throat> is deactivated for the webinar, so please use the question and answer box. Uh, the questions from webinar participants are very welcome. Uh, we have great panelists and they will do their best to answer your questions. Should anything stay open, uh, don't hesitate to come back to us in writing and we'll have to give you the answers subsequently. Uh, the sequence of events uh, will be guided through uh, our moderator, who will present each speaker ahead of the respective thematic presentation. After each short uh, presentation, there will be ample time for a lively exchange with the webinar participants, so please make use of the Q&A uh, box. Uh, for matters of practicality, we'll reserve the question and answer after every one of the speakers has uh, done his short presentation of seven to eight minutes. Now it's a great honor to present today's moderator. Geoffrey Hamilton heads the Public Private Partnerships Program and is Chief of the Cooperation and Partnerships Section at the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. He's a connoisseur of the PPP ecosystem and has a wealth of knowledge on PPP policy. It's a privilege to have a strong advocate for strengthening the gender balance amongst PPP professionals from all sectors and civil society like him to moderate today's web webinar. I wish us a lively and enriching debate on this highly topical issue. And without further ado, I would like to give the floor to our moderator. Well, uh, thank you very uh, much, uh, Jean-Christophe. I first have to make, make sure that I'm being heard and, and maybe not so much importance to let, let me be seen, but uh, at least I'm heard. So that, that's the main thing. So let's kick off. And first of all, let me thank WAP for taking this opportunity. Yes, this is a subject dear to my heart. I, I desperately want to see women's empowerment in public-private partnerships. Infrastructure is a is a is a is a challenge. Uh, construction is a is a challenge for and 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 something where women are underrepresented. And and I think we we want to ask some good questions from this you know this debate. Uh, what you know? Uh, how are people doing with respect to addressing this this issue? Are, are we doing enough? Um, uh, um, uh, what should we do? What what is necessary to go forward on this particular issue? Um, how can we? And, and then how? What 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 is the types of actions that are going to make a, a, a change? Because we don't want to meet again in three years and not to have achieved progress. And 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 um, I, and I think we've got in our. Um, speakers list some excellent people who are going to make a difference in our, our discussion. And my job is to introduce them and, and um, some of them I know very, very well um, and most of them, in fact, I do. So I'm delighted that um, WAP has managed to convene a top, top group of people we can certainly learn um, some great, get, get some uh, insights and also um, some ideas on the roadmap on, on how we go forward on this uh, very important subject. So my, my first uh, speaker is uh, Miss Maud de Votebolt. Uh, she's director of 
tools and knowledge at the Global Infrastructure Hub in Sydney. This was set up a few years ago and she does a marvellous job because she's based in Sydney and it's quite a job being an international organisation of such a uh, high reputation and having to sort of organise things globally uh, from, from Australia. But she has magnificent experience in public and private sectors and has dealt with concrete projects. So she has pro project experience from a, a, a global perspective and she served on various boards of directors representing the Minister of fi Finance of France. Uh, and she also has worked in Bouygues, uh, the big uh, French uh, infrastructure con contractor. So she's got a wealth of experience. So Maud, I I'm going to give you the floor now and if you could uh, just keep to around seven or eight minutes, that would be absolutely uh, perfect. So please, Maud, we're very interested to hear what you're going to, going to say. Yes, thank you, Geoffrey. And uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you for your invitation to speak and the opportunity to kick off this session. So um, I will present tonight uh, the Gender and Inclusive Infrastructure a guidance tool of the Global Infrastructure Hub, but more importantly, uh, some practical framework to actually um, for the practitioner and policy makers to have some tools and some um, to improve uh, inclusivity in infrastructure. So next slide, please. Um, what is uh, inclusive infrastructure? So um, you can just click on the slide, yes. Uh, the definition we, we, we gave during the, um, in the tool was actually an inclusive infrastructure is an, infra it's, um, an infrastructure development that enhance positive outcomes in social inclusivity and ensure no individual community or social group is left behind or prevented from benefiting from improved infrastructure. So it's not just inclusion. Uh, inclusion is more than just participation. Um, and just in this guidance, I wanted to mention that we are not just focusing on gender balance and gender equity, but we also target uh, stakeholder groups such as low income, unemployment, youth disability and elderly group and how to improve their representation and their involvement in infrastructure at all stage of the uh, life cycle. So next slide, please. Um, so for the inclusive infrastructure guidance tool, um, maybe next slide, please. We reviewed over 100 sources across all infrastructure sectors. And the key finding was that we must aim for more than do not arm passive, which is a passive approach, to a more positive approach and engage with key stakeholders groups at early stage and all away, um, all along the way of infrastructure project. And that's uh, one of the quotes from this work which is a very important work, leave no one behind, uh, from Fiona Hadji, with, uh, from the UK Institute for um, Development Studies in 2016. So um, next slide, please. Um, just to have one snapshot of the SDGs that everybody know now, the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. Um, those goals we will not be reached without increasing gender equity in and through infrastructure development. Here I have three actually uh, SDG uh, that are uh, together working with the gender equity. So gender equity um, uh, if we improve gender equity, that will also improve um, the poverty, which is um, the, the SDG number one, and of course, uh, reduce inequality. Uh, inclusive infrastructure aims to reduce inequality in the level of access to use of and control over infrastructure facilities by services by men and women. Uh, when inequalities within the household 
knowledge gaps, lack of education and cultural restriction are addressed, higher gender parity in earning can be achieved, and a significant increase in human capital wealth um, to up to 18% can be generated. So that's why it's so important and the benefits are uh, really uh, major. Next slide, please. So with the hub, we actually, uh, why, why, why the hub was um, working on this uh, very important topic. Um, so there actually were very, very few or very little uh, practical, practical guidance on inclusive infrastructure. Um, so um, that's why um, uh, we decided to actually work on this topic. It was also completely aligned with the quality infrastructure um, and the G20 roadmap, roadmap to infrastructure as an asset class uh, set up by Argentina in the, by the G20 presidency, but uh, mo mo most also with the quality infrastructure, uh, which is the main topic of the Japanese presidency. Uh, so um, there were a knowledge gap, as I just mentioned, um, about how to actually, in the practical way, uh, give some um, examples to see how uh, policymakers can improve um, the uh, more uh, inclusive infrastructure. Um, and we wanted to have a very, um, very practical approach, uh, sharing examples and best practices, and not just stay at and removing the jargon uh, with, um, with, with having a very um, practical uh, guidance. So, uh, next slide, please. So, I want to, so maybe next slide, please. I'd like to go just to the more important slide. That's the framework. So, that's the framework we can actually set up for the uh, inclusive infrastructure. You can see action areas on the left column here uh, in various areas of the uh, infrastructure uh, life cycle and different components. And on the right side, you have actu actually the application and practical application for each of those. So um, if I take, uh, for example, um, uh, the policy regulation and standards, um, then uh, we, we will have in the guidance some development about how inclusive policy development and implementation can be drafted uh, by government um, and also inclusive standards and universal design that can be um, uh, uh, favorize some fragile groups such as uh, disability, elderly and of course uh, also women. So next slide please. So here I will stay with my example about the policy regulation and standards and just uh, give you one or two uh, specific examples in, of key guidance on gender. So for example, for uh, the adoption of an inclusive approach and key guidance on gender by policymakers, for example, in um, uh, introducing contractual clause requiring female participation or promote women's involvement in civil and po political activities. Um, for example, in the policy, uh, there can be some, um, some, some policy measure around the percentage of women um, in the project workforce at all stage in the project team for the project lead of the infrastructure project, but also, of course, uh, in the workforce for implementing or delivering the infrastructure. Um, in the uh, criteria of the bidding uh, procurement process, they can also have some percentage of women-owned uh, business uh, to be uh, pushed um, to have um, more women uh, in those um, areas. So uh, in the guidance, we have a lot of examples um, of case study uh, that, uh, that can illustrate and showcase better those different applications. Next slide, well, please. Maud, yeah. I, I, we're, we're running out of time. Uh, these are some very yeah. good, powerful messages. Um, maybe we could go back to the other information in the slide uh, at the end, if, if, you, if you don't mind. Uh, sure. these, but 
but I think you, no you put some very, very important yeah. messages. Yes, I will maybe just maybe we can go to the the last two the last two slides, which are two case study. So you can give you some uh, practical examples. So you can go to the next one. Um, yes. Yeah, so the the well, that's the last slide. Very good. So that's yeah, that's the the Bogota Transmilenio bus rapid transit, and just an application of how gender perspective we're actually bringing into this project. So for in Colombia, the, the transport project, uh, one of the main thing was about the um, uh, planning stage uh, to have some ex exclusive access for women for safety reason in the bus and transport and also capacity building workshops uh, for operators uh, on anti-discrimination uh, approach. And uh, the U.S. Bank Stadium project, infrastructure and PPP project, um, we uh, this project consider minimum targets uh, for integrating women uh, and um, in infrastructure project at workforce level, but also at project level. So it's two examples that are uh, much more, of course, deep dive and detailed in the guidance. Um, but yes, thank you very much. Very, I think very, I'm very running out of time. <laughs> Thank you, Maude. You've given us some very interesting case studies and that's important. And one is on uh, transport and we have Anne uh, from the, I always, she's from the Transport Public Genvois. Uh, this is the, 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 the public system I used to use before the pandemic, but um, she will, uh, I'm sure, concur with the importance of advancing women in, in these types of employments. Uh, but I'm going now to Irina Unkowski, who's the operations officer with the African Development Bank. Um, Irina, I'm going to ask you, where are you from? Because um, I'm, I'm curious to know which, which country you, you're, you're actually from in, in, and carrying out this excellent work on, on women in, in public-private partnerships for the, for the African Development Bank. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, originally, I come from Belgrade, from Serbia, but uh, I was based in African continent for more than 30 years. So I, I do consider myself uh, quite an African child. Um, so I'm based in South Africa in Johannesburg at the moment. Well, I, I, Irina, I detect a, a South African accent, which is a lovely accent. And, and, and so congratulations for doing that. And Irina, please, we're very interested to hear uh, this, this, what it's like in Africa and also the, the situation on women's empowerment. There is a meeting, I think, on the 5th of October with Beatrice, one of our network who's from Uganda. And I'm, I'm very interested to hear things are moving quite purposefully in, in, the con in, in your continent. So very, very pleased to hear what you're going to say. Um, thank you, Jeffrey, for that. Um, I thought that for our audience today, it would be quite interesting to see what's actually happening on the ground at the moment um, from the women-led businesses and how COVID actually impacted this whole situation. Um, I think it's a very hot topic at the moment, um, not just at the moment, but also prior to this, specifically because it's, we are talking about SMEs, um, and also developing in fragile states as well. So um, I have the honor to present today a survey that has been done um, in, I think it was completed in July this year, 2020. Um, about 1,300 women uh, SME owners have been uh, consulted. Um, and also it was around 30 African countries. Now, not to say that this um, survey is only applicable to African continent. I think it actually will resonate with uh, most of our audience as well. But just to give you sort of a picture, prior to uh, the COVID, uh, it was very ambitious 5.2% growth for Africa and for Sub-Saharan African growth. Uh, and as the COVID hit, uh, we contracted by 1.6% in economic uh, sort of, um, you know, words. Um, again, so prior to the pandemic as well, most um, small and medium uh, enterprises didn't have a favorable sort of financial um, you know, approach towards the lending, towards uh, the cash flows. So it was already a very difficult environment for them as well. 
Um, but again, you know, when we think about it, 80% of SMEs in total create our workforce. I mean, it's a staggering number. Um, and uh, it really, really impacted women-led businesses as well. If we can go on to the next slide, please. Right, so from just a number of uh, statistics here, um, if we actually look at the, um, the numbers of the women-led businesses that actually partially shut down or shut down during the pandemic was in a region of about 80%. Um, 41 percent reduced working hours, 34 percent were retrenched, and then 25 percent took a very big knock on their salaries. I mean, these are some really big and staggering numbers to the fact that, again, um, you know, 96 percent have seen economic activity to be reduced, particularly, for example, in a country such as Mali. Um, and we all know, again, political situation there as well. Um, however, it's very interesting to see that 64% of the women-led businesses uh, versus the 52% of men-led businesses have been affected. So again, more impact on women-led businesses rather than the men. Um, again, the areas that have been impacted the most because that's where women-led businesses are most active um, is, uh, for example, agriculture, where 60% has been contracted in, in this sector, and then eventually um, areas such as, um, you know, tourism, hospitality, fashion industry, um, infrastructure as well from that perspective, and trade have been drastically impacted uh, to almost, you know, a halt as well. Um, it's been estimated that about $12 million, so we're talking about the developing countries again, uh, that translates to about 10,000 per business is needed to just stay afloat, just to stay alive and to have some, some sort of a heartbeat during these times. Right, so if we actually think about this whole sort of uh, impact, and I mean, not only COVID can happen, anything can happen in our lives, and especially if it's a sort of women oriented and women led, I mean, it has a lot of psychological um, you know, impact as well as economic impact. So it's been said that 42% of women entrepreneurs that have respond, uh, you know, responded, um, their ability to pay the rent, their ability to you know, keep on their livelihoods, which only tells you that they're the possibly even sole providers for the family as well. And then 53% ex experience some sort of a psychological stress resulting from this. Um, so it's been extremely difficult time for, for women-led businesses. Again, the lack of support measures, not many, sorry, uh, the lack of the support measures, again, you know, have been um, re registered as well because a lot of these women cannot or do not have anybody to turn to. Um, and then again, economic retrenchment uh, in women-led businesses further amplified by society. I mean, 40% of Africa's SMEs, so almost half is accounted for um, in an African continent. The other thing that I just wanted to measure, uh, mention, sorry, is that pre-COVID-19 situation, we didn't, the picture wasn't the, the greatest either, right? I mean, we had a lot of the issues, and I think Jeffrey, you all know this as well, the best, because you come also from that um, background and worked on a couple of the projects. The gender gap in access to technology is vast. I mean, 45% of women are less likely to be on, uh, not to not to be online um, rather than the men. And, and we all know that now e-commerce is a huge thing. So that's one of the things. Unfavorable loan terms as well towards women. They don't have access to any advisory, technical, or marketing support. So it's all of these things when we when we actually take into consideration even prior to COVID-19 and are pushed by the COVID-19 it's it's just um, you know of a very grand nature as well next slide please thank you all right so from that perspective of you know the statistics and what has been investigated I gave just sort of some of the 
um, flash points. Uh, the, the, our audience can actually have a look at this. It's a survey, it's readily available online. It's been, sorry, I forgot to mention, it's been done uh, by the African Development Bank, UN Women and Impact, her excellent job that they have done as well in such a short period of time. But while we are talking about these statistics, we also have to see, so what is now the way or how can we now improve this um, you know, situation as well? So the first thing is to actually introduce this gender smart stimulus, which again talks about you know, concessional loans, the grants, tax debt con uh, condonations, rental and util utility sub subsidies or moratoria, and provide for the women a much more favorable conditions so they don't have to, in other words, stress about you know, how am I going to afford this or pay for this in t uh, terms like this. Now, the one thing that I would like to stress is the relaxation of collateral requirements. From my personal perspective, for example, which I found extremely, um, you know, sort of derogatory in a way as well, is that um, I was in a situation where, um, you know, I wanted to raise a loan and without my husband's approval, I wasn't able to with the commercial banks, which is so, so, uh, you know, this day and age, it's extremely uh, ridiculous in a way, you know, um, and all of these women, particularly in the rural areas, they don't own anything, they don't have much, but they still need the capital. Um, and a lot of these situations require this collateral requirements. So it's extremely important that we relax them. Gender responsive procurement practices, again, uh, you know, from the policy perspective, when we are looking at from the government point of view, we need to actually put women first and provide pro procurement, um, you know, uh, favorable again terms that the women can get involved as well. Um, relaxation of interest rates, patient capital required, which means, in other words, for our non financial colleagues on the line, is that basically we are looking at the capital that it's long term uh, with no expectations of you know a turning a quick back basically so it's more I, of a social impact i'm I, finishing I really, i'm almost done i'm no, almost done very very powerful messages and i think very important messages we need to yeah. talk to the banks to get things done i just wondered irena maybe maybe if you if you don't mind i'll, I'll move on but we w want to return to what you you said i mean I, I think the questions that we're setting in this session are are we doing enough uh, i mean infrastructure uh, construction transport these are difficult areas for women to get advanced in and we we want to know if if we're not doing enough to try and advance women how do we make a, di a difference you mentioned maybe in the financial sector this might be one way and then what should we do as a group because we've got some powerful people here uh, on the panel and and it would be nice under the auspices of wap to actually see if we could collectively do something that would make a make a difference and one of the ideas one of the ideas that i would like to raise and and this leads me on to the next speaker uh and uh, hornung sukup who's chair of the board of directors of transport Port, uh, public genois um is is can we mobilize the private sector can we mobilize private companies to to make a difference in this in this program so that they can actually you know use their skills resources and and goodwill so that they can help with with advancing uh, uh, and, and making a difference on this topic uh, and, and and try and give them incentives to 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 actually make a difference now I, I, I remember Anne exceptionally well from the forum that we organized uh, a few years ago on women's empowerment and public private partnerships and Anne was one of the, the stars uh, uh, coming up even with a commitment that her company would advance, I think by 20% Anne, um, the, the representation of women uh, throughout, throughout the, 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 the company. Anne, I'm not going to hold this to you because you were very brave and, and you were the one, the only one I think who made such a, a commitment, You much to your credit, but I am most interested to hear what, how you're getting on and what progress you are made. made. So Anne, please, you, you have the floor. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's an honor to be here and an honor to be uh, 
with these um, uh, very qualified speakers. So thank you very much for that. We can go on to the next uh, slide. Um, this is who is TPG. TPG is the public transport company of Geneva. It's buses, uh, trolley buses and trams. And just a few gender oriented um, statistics out of the employees, only 13% are women. And I'm working on that as fast as I can, Jeffrey, but it's not very quick. The board is 20 people of whom 35% are women. That's no thanks to me because the board is extremely uh, fixed in representation. So it's outside entities that uh, appoint people. So I haven't been able to Im increase that. But at least the chair, myself and the vice chair, we're both women. And since I arrived in 2016, we have hired two women managers out of the eight. So at least we're at 25% of managers where we were at zero when I joined. So Jeffrey, I am trying as hard as I can, but it's not exactly um, easy. Uh, I'd like to go on to the second slide. <clears throat> Uh, we did a project a couple of years ago, which Jeffrey was talking about because I presented it a couple of times in front of UN uh, groups and this we're very proud of this project entirely Swiss. It's called the Toza. It's an electric flash charging bus. There's a little picture of it there. Um, and Toza actually stands for the main partners, which is T is the TPG, a public organization. O is the OPI, a promotion, industrial promotion office, which is public. SIG is the Geneva Electricity Company, which is also public, but the flash charging technology, which is really the amazing part of the project, was developed by ABB, which is a very large uh, private, publicly listed, but private company. And then the ad advantages, just to be very brief, it diminishes or eliminates three types of pollu pollution, air pollution, noise pollution, and visual pollution, meaning no overhead lines. The timeline, it took a while, it was 2011 to 2018. We introduced 12 buses to the TPG network in December a couple of years ago, and at the end of the day withdrew them because there was, an, there was um, overheating of the batteries. So this is how an innovation project goes. It goes in lurches. It was a fantastic project. It was, we were all very enthusi enthusiastic about it. But when it was launched, it needed another year of uh, work on it. Um, but if I can uh, make up for what I just said, the recent developments are this system, the Toza system has been sold to a city in France and a city in Australia. Was there any gender diversity requirement? Nothing of any kind. I mean, zero, we are talking about zero. However, of course, a clean energy bus is better for all public health, meaning women you know, and, and other races. I mean, other, it's good for everyone. We are now working on a current project. This is our next uh, public-private project. We're very proud of this. It's financed by the, this is a, an on-demand minibus service. There's the minibus there. And it's in four European cities. And Geneva is piloting, if I can use that wonderful word, word, Geneva is piloting the project from the University of Geneva. But the other cities include Lyon, Luxembourg, and Copenhagen. And the partners are definitely public-private. If you look at the list of partners, we're definitely a mix of public and private. Very intense, very intense working together. The finance, it's financed by the European Union in Mobility Research Fund, 16 million euros over four years. So this is really an amazing uh, project, and I think it's going to make leaps and bounds in autonomous uh, minibus uh, situations. Gender diversity, the TPG team, um, you know, under my pressure, but also many others, is two people, okay, but it's 50% women, and uh, I think that's at least a start. The advisory committee for the project, if you look at the project website, is four people, they're all men. They invited four women to be on the advisory committee, and none of them could or was willing to. So this is a big disappointment, but um, we, will, we will make progress on that. The European Union does encourage gender diversity in every project. So the reporting on this project to the European Union, which I believe is very frequent, maybe not monthly, but three monthly, um, that, is, that requires uh, gender reporting. So that's a good thing. Pre-COVID and post-COVID, um, there is, Oh, if I, I mean, this is my wish list, but part of this is just so, it's duh, you know, it's things like, really? I mean, do we really have to be talking about this in 2020? Pre-COVID, no attention to gender. Like, duh, we should in integrate a diversity goal in every single project that's done, in every PPP project. We still have all male engineers and urban planners, and we need diversity of teams at all levels, top to bottom. 
um, cities have been planned traditionally over decades, if not centuries, but certainly decades by male, uh, white people. I have no, you know, no, don't take this personally, Jeffrey and Jean-Christophe, but I mean, we need more women, we need more people of color, we need more people of all kinds of diverse, um, diverse uh, backgrounds. There is a report that comes out yearly in the United States, it's called Dangerous by Design. And it means that streets are actually designed for cars, which makes them dangerous for every other person, whether it's women, children, families, you know, people of all kinds, it's dangerous. These streets are designed to be dangerous. And this is absolutely staggering. It's something that I think everyone should read. Um, as I say, pre-COVID is priority to cars. We need priority to people. Uh, streets have been designed for decades for cars, to speed up cars, to make cars faster, to make them turn faster and we're killing people. We're killing 400 people a month in the United States. That's a major jet falling out of the sky every month and nobody talks about it. We've gotten used over the years to twice daily rush hours where it's packed, twice, this is us, public transport, it's packed twice a day. And then the rest of the time there's plenty of room. This doesn't work. It doesn't work for people in the rush hour and it doesn't work for people outside. We need to smooth this out. So to me, that's businesses and schools adjusting their hours, more teleconferencing, and this is better for women families and also for men. And then of course, bus stops being dark, you know, unsafe. That's a, that's a given in many different series. And then, I mean, um, many different cities. And then public transport, as I say, more than just priority, you know, removing priority from cars, Public transport has to be de dedicated to more than just people. People, of course, but in the course of a day, we could go on our bike, we could go on electric scooter, we could take strollers, we could be in a wheelchair, and we could bring home, you know, I'm thinking of big boxes from, from uh, shopping places, and that's men and women. So we need space for that. And we can't do that with twice daily rush hours. It has to be smoothed out. So all of this to say, there is so much to do and once I would like to go back to Maud's presentation, which was really amazing because she has a figure that exactly corresponds to our figure. The infrastructure return, she said, is 18%. The TPG asked for a, a study, this came out last year, and this, this will be my last point. The study came out last year, it was a very conservatively done study of public transport. What is the economic return of public transport? What is, you know, what does it give us in economic return? Cost compared to return. And what did that study find? It was extremely conservative. They gave very prudent, um, you know, guidelines in this study, which I objected to and I told them that. But their, their study came up with, if you invest one Swiss franc in public transport in Geneva, you get 1.18 return in economic return which is exactly the 18% that Maud uh, mentioned at the beginning, which is absolutely amazing that the two figures are alike. There is just one last point I can't resist. In the United States, there has been a study of the economic return of public transport, and they came up to up to four times, meaning if you invest $1 in public transport, you will get up to $4 in economic return. On that, I will stop. I think we have a fascinating discussion to do. Thank you very much, Anne. Well done. I mean, it's uh, uh, it's an amazing thing what you're doing. Uh, I mean, we're talking about Switzerland. Even Geneva maybe has been one of the more advanced of the cantons, but it's an absolutely um, challenging situation trying to advance women. We've seen how uh, we, we heard about the banking and we know the Swiss banks have to get sort of approval from uh, from their men to, to take out big financial transactions it's still a uh, it, it's a difficult situation and a difficult challenging environment and you've done wonders in the situation you've found yourself in and these projects that you are uh, are advancing are, are, are tremendous and I wanted you to think the the question I raised whether we can do more with respect to sensitizing the private sector in the infrastructure area to see if we can get them involved in undertaking uh, projects and, and giving them recognition for what they're doing. For me, this is always the flip side of something that, that, that you've got to give uh, recognition of those companies that are trying to make a difference. And, and, and I wanted to see whether this might be something that we could work on as, as a group uh, going forward in this, in this activity. 
my last speaker, but last but certainly not least, is, is Valeska Guerrero Limos. Now, Valeska worked with me inside the public private partnership team uh, at the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe here in Geneva and was, was an outstanding member. Uh, she's, she's a Mexican a Mexican national, which is fantastic. But she also was, and this is unusual in the United Nations, she actually came from the private sector, from uh, 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 from Siemens, a company where she had a, a tremendous experience, particularly in the health care sector. And, and she was extremely motivated and wanting to take forward the main message of the United Nations PPP program in Geneva, People First Public Private Partnerships. So, um, Valeska, I'm very interested to get your insights into how we can marshal the private sector to try and actually create more impact in women's empowerment and infrastructure and transport and, 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 and also the social services, healthcare and so on. And, and uh, you're certainly a, a young woman, but dynamic woman, and I'm most interested to hear what you're going to tell us uh, just now. So please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, uh, for this wonderful introduction. Uh, it is gra a great honor for me to be part of this webinar along these uh, leaders, you know, as part of, of the wonderful speakers right now that have presented very useful information. Um, yeah, I would like to, to start um, by... Um, just a second. Okay, yeah, because I changed the slide. Um, yeah, I just would like to start on how the COVID-19 crisis has impacted women. You know, uh, first of all, I would like to say that women make up of 39% of global employment, but account uh, for 54% of overall job losses, according to McKinsey. I mean, this figure is extremely high. And not only that, but also young women have been uh, really impacted because of this crisis. Um, this means, for instance, from the 267 million young people uh, globally classified by the ILO as not in, in employment, education, or training, two-thirds of it are young women. So the, this means that women uh, is at greater risk than men uh, with regards to, to overall employment, but also to PPPs, uh, due to the downturn in the services sector. This comes back uh, to what uh, our previous speakers were discussing, that um, women represent a, a share in the services sector, um, basically in healthcare. Healthcare, well, now it's a, a very dynamic sector. And if you ask me, Geoffrey, how women can be empowered, definitely the healthcare sector would be one of it. Uh, but also we have to increase the share in the economic infrastructure. Uh, right now, for instance, there are a lot of women who are, um, who are um, let's say, working, but without even payment or without social security. For instance, they account to 75% of unpaid uh, care. So uh, if we get, take a lens on, on PPPs, and this is probably a little bit for a little bit um, in relation to what Maud discussed with the framework of, of the GIH is how uh, the gender lens can actually be part of PPPs, uh, taking into account the, the great impact that COVID-19 has had in, in different sectors, uh, like let's say accommodation, food service, wholesale, trade, other services, even tourism, where women uh, actually are employed and play an important role. Um, the manufacturing industries have been also quite impacted, and I have here an interesting, uh, an interesting figure that says that female employment in the industry only accounts to 15% during the current crisis. Before, in 2012, it was 17%. So this means that, that women are, are not represented in this, in, the, in this industry, and at the same time, we haven't made progress at all. Uh, with regards to that. So if we take a look on, on the PPP cycle, definitely analyzing the gender aspects of the, during preparation, appraisal stages, and at early stage of consultations is quite important because uh, we have to address the needs of women. But we, don't we can't forget 
that women, we are also contributors. We are workers, we are leaders. We, we play a very important uh, role in the society and the economy. So this is quite important to analyze uh, from, from this point of view across the entire PPP cycle. Um, another part, I mean, also this is also based on the World Bank, McKinsey, and, and, and other authors, is that we have to translate the results into the design of projects and programs, uh, initiatives, policies. Uh, I think it, it has been done, but it hasn't been enough. It hasn't definitely been enough. Um, the third point is um, how to narrow this gender gap, I mean, throughout the cycle, how to translate the resource, how the results, sorry, how to actually uh, elaborate, you know, the right policies, the right instruments, we have to have as well indicators. And I think if we have a framework, uh, then we can have definitely categories and indicators. I know, Geoffrey, uh, the UN is doing the people for PPP impact assessment tool, so this is also an important thing to take into account. Uh, I want to, to, to highlight the ones that McKinsey um, elaborated because I think these are quite important on PPPs but also in the economy as a whole. So this means uh, the equality in work. Definitely women are underrepresented. Uh, this means that we even I mean, we earn less than, than men. We are not in the same positions as men. Uh, we play, of course, also a role for essential services with the design of infrastructure, but we are also enable, enablers of economic opportunity. This means that entrepreneurship is quite important. Uh, also, we are not uh, protected appropriately. I mean, we don't have access. I mean, some of them, I, I, don't, I don't want to say we, but um, I personally am in a nice position. Uh, th I mean, thankfully, but not uh, all the women are in the same position, mostly in developing economies. And uh, definitely that we have security and autonomy. That, and autonomy we mean as well that we are empowered and we can, uh, that our voices are heard. So this is uh, important. The next slide, please. So I will we'll just finish quickly on how we can empower women in PPPs for the post-COVID-19 recovery phase. Um, first of all, social security packages. I, I speak it for myself because I had uh, I was unfortunate as well due to the to the COVID crisis. Uh, I'm I'm currently as well. Uh, to to be to become an entrepreneur to to you know to foster my creativity but thankfully i have uh, access to social security but other other women across the world don't have access to social security packages and and therefore this is quite important to 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 make this happen in different countries to have aid specifically to 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 support women and and the ones that are the pillar of their families you know um, and notably as well in PPPs, if we, if we say, okay, we have women working in PPP areas and we can provide further support to women so that they are employed, so that they are uh, trained as well. And uh, this goes back, I mean, this point go, goes back to the second one that I wanted to mention, which is women entrepreneurship. I think Irina mentioned that at the example of Africa as well. Uh, that entrepreneurship policies and initiatives are important uh, for the COVID-19 recovery phase, not, not only in impacted sectors, which are quite critical, I think that that would be the first phase, but also the ones that have not been impacted so that women are also able to work in the economic infrastructure because we have seen that they have participated more in the social infrastructure sector, so I think it is important. And another, uh, another relevant aspect is the use of digital infrastructure. We have seen now because of the, of the pandemic that we really need digital instruments. We need access to the internet. We need access uh, to, to be, you know, to, to online information. So I think this is uh, an, an extremely critical point where women can actually be empowered. I mean, if we use digital infrastructure, we can even reduce the gender gap in, in across sectors. And, and also coming back to my, I mean, sorry, going back to the last point, digital information can be used for training purposes and for women. I think women um, need leadership and training 
um, especially the young women. We have seen they, they are not trained, they are not even employed, they don't have access to education. So we really need that to mitigate the existing inequalities, which definitely have been exacerbated due to the COVID-19 crisis. So I just want to finish um, by saying that I call for the support of governments, the private sector, academia, international organizations to um, create an initiative uh, for leadership of women, especially the younger generations, because we are the future and the champions to recover from the, this COVID-19 crisis. Maybe this is a good uh, opportunity to also mention the new program that WAP has uh, activated uh, that is led by Jinan Ghosh, um, who is helping young PPP professionals uh, to find mentorship programs. And uh, so we welcome uh, all PPP professionals uh, to seek mentorship, mentorship uh, to more experienced uh, professionals. Thank you. Thank you, Jack Christo. Geoffrey, maybe you would like to present quickly the action plan for the public and private sector and for our women in people. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Uh, th th thank you. And thank you, Valeska, for drawing our attention to the absolute importance of focusing work on, on, on young women. I think this is a, a, a very powerful message a strong recommendation and something that we should act upon and i think uh, if you allow me jean christophe we we really need to go from the guidance into the action uh, i mean this is the sustainable development goals it's not a list of academic principles it's a list of actions that need to be undertaken and and one of the light motifs of our work in geneva with the ppp team is to try and bring the private sector because they have the resources the skills the technology uh, and the knowledge to to really make a difference um, but at the same time we can't just rely on the private sector we've also got to bring uh, uh, the governments on board too. So we drew up, and, and this has actually come out from a number of events that we've held in Geneva on women's empowerment, uh, flagging the issue, raising awareness, uh, getting support, and, and generally we've had some very powerful discussions um, that, that have taken place in under our, our auspices, uh, Anne was in, in, involved in, in one of them with IKEA, also the head of uh, the uh, International Trade Center in Geneva, which has a very interesting program called She Trades. I'm not so fantastically excited by the, the name of it, but it's a very dynamic one to get women involved in trade, and, and it's called She Trades, and it's, it's a really very, very important one that I, I would commend very strongly. The, the proposals that we have here are, 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 trying, are directed to governments, they're ad addressed to governments and private sector, and they're also addressed to the private, uh, to the private sector by, them, by themselves. And, and we see that the private sector can play uh, a very strong role uh, in uh, advancing women and and also governments can play an, a, a strong role in in their procurement programs in for example making sure that in the um, in the selection of people in public procurement they they, they favor women led companies and 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 give them uh, you know uh, preference in in these these policies while the private sector can also do a tremendous amount in um, helping, even in the communities in which they are doing business, helping women become entrepreneurs. And, and here we've got experiences of companies, especially in China, doing that, particularly giving women the possibility to um, start a career and, and, and not just in the company, but into the, in society as entrepreneurs. And, and, we had an, an idea in our activity of setting up centers of excellence and women's empowerment, one in Europe, one in Africa, and, and one in Asia. And the idea here was to bring um, a, through a kind of digital platform, women with their mobile phones into contact with enterprises, particularly the human resource departments within enterprises, so that the, the enterprises would give an opportunity to women with their business ideas, 
uh, even as interns going into the company to get business experience um, and, and, and also, as I was saying, in the supply chain as, as, as opportunities in the professional sense, as joint ventures with private companies, but giving them an opportunity to be empowered. And we saw that this, uh, the foundation stones for this digital platform where 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 were the governments with government run agencies and we even had Tanzania one of the african countries that was very interested in this topic almost on the brink of getting um uh, th this started but it didn't work the the donor um didn't come forward and and so we were left a little bit in limbo so my my sort of feeling here is that yes we can go in with what what's needed and it's clear there is a con so, so here we go well look i think it's now good to engage with the audience and find out what they think about this and my my urging is to try and get focus on practical solutions and how we can do better uh, as, as a group to work together in empowering uh, women so so perhaps this is now uh, a good time for as you call it, the questions and answers and, and, and comments uh, stage. Okay. So how, how can we do this? Well, so I, would, I would suggest that all panelists please switch on the uh, cameras and when they want to speak also the microphones. And uh, we have an interesting question coming from Anela Karahasan, who says, good afternoon, greetings from Anela Karahasan on behalf of the Chamber of Economy. Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, from Bosnia and Herzegovina, especially greetings to Mr. Hamilton. We met at the UNECEPPP conference in December 2019 in Geneva. I would like to support Mrs. Unkowski, among others, because unfortunately the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina for women businesses is also not so good. Especially, there is no PPP project that supports and involves more women. At this moment, only available in small amount that govern, government provide for support women businesses. So in chamber, we working on active connection between public and private sector in the aim to develop PPP project for empowering and supporting women businesses in the post COVID period and involve more women. We are at the disposal for more advice and networking. So thank you for this webinar and please be free to get in touch with me for the region of Boston and Herzegovina, and she gives her email address. So um, I believe this is an interesting question that our panelists will be happy to answer. Maybe Irina, you would like to go first? Yeah, hi. So, so this is a very, sorry, uh, uh, excellent uh, comment. And uh, I was just about to probably close my um, a presentation by actually referring back to the PPPs as well and what uh, but I guess that it was touched quite a bit with uh, with other panelists also is this. that from the private sector point of view when we actually do get involved in the PPPs we have to first of all it's going to be it has to be driven by the government because the private sector is there to make money so that's that's one thing so we need to drive it from a different perspective and that different perspective is policies reforms government involvement UN involved whatever involvement there is so that's number one so we need to be active in that field and um, the private how the private sector then can help is involve women-led businesses give them preferential rates if it's a lending issue um, also provide for them in a sense of the training of the managerial support um, and so on and so forth so that they can actually um, get that experience that it's valid and confidence in themselves that they can actually execute on a large infrastructure project. So from engineering field, technical fields, but also from the project point of view. I mean, we have a lot of social infrastructure in a sense, hospitals, educations, where as we saw with COVID-19, a lot of the women, more actually women, have been impacted as a professionals in that field rather than the men. So that's one thing. The other thing is also from a PPP perspective is that um, we have to think about the projects, not only how to you know, materially and everything else enhance women during the project as well, but for their livelihoods, how, how are these projects going to make their lives better? And I think Anne's presentation with the transport, for example, you know, con connectivity issues, 
uh, doing the trade, all sorts of stuff. So from both angles, we can look at it in that respect and you know push forward. But I think that the major thing is from the government point of view or from a global point of view for this thing to be driven down and drilled so that throughout the time, excuse me, throughout the time, the private sector actually does not recognize this as a must, but rather as a, you know, I'm actually benefiting from this thing much more than I could ever hoped for, you know. So that's one of my answers that I can provide here. Thank you. Back to you, JC, or George. Both to anybody else for that matter, sorry. Uh, just uh, well, let, if I if I can just, I'm a slightly disagreeing with you, Irina. Slightly disagreeing yeah. with you because I understand that the private sector need to get profits, but I'm hoping that with the UN and the Sustainable Development Goals, a new private sector is going to emerge. It has to because the simple mathematics of getting universal access to healthcare, uh, sustainable energy, education, these are not going to be done by governments alone. 30 years of working in the UN has taught me one thing. Governments, particularly in low and medium income countries, are rather weak. And we need the private sector to come and fill a gap and to try and take issues of women's empowerment forward. And I believe that we're now, sustainability is now becoming a watchword, not just of the governments, but also of the private sector. And I'm beginning to see things change. Also the purpose economy, purpose enterprises, companies want to put a purpose before profit even. So I'm, 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 I'm a little bit more, <laughs> <laughs> optimistic than maybe you are about the private sector but I want to see also recognition given, given to the private sector who do a better job I, I, and I, I, this is where we're lacking UNEC can write as much guidance as we want we can write up 500 principles of action but what I'm wanting to see is real actions by private sector which which are making a difference and and that will also have a, a, a peer impact on their competitors and encourage them also to perform uh, to perform better I wondered if anyone else would like to sort of address this issue of trying to get private sector more involved. Anne, uh, you, you've done a major job in Geneva. What's your perspective on getting other companies, even in Switzerland, to take women's empowerment more, more seriously? Is there, is, there, is there some hope for, for, for a more <laughs> robust strategy here? Yeah, I think there's always hope, Jeffrey. You know me by now, and I'm very, very positive and optimistic. Um, I think that there, there are several different things that should be done. One thing that I'm wondering, and maybe someone who's um, participating in this knows the answer, you know, there's now a system of called, the, called the B Corps, and the B Corps are sustainable uh, uh, companies all over the world which have to go through a rather rigorous system of um, checks and, and controls, and then they're certified B Corps. And I imagine that in that there is, and I don't even know, I'm ashamed that I don't know whether there is a gender requirement, but it's something I'm gonna like, you know, stop this at the end of this, um, this uh, workshop, I'm gonna stop and look it up immediately. Another thing, and Jeffrey, this is gonna sound very um, superficial and it's not at all. One thing in private uh, corporations that we need is more visibility for women. And as I say, it sounds cosmetic and it sounds superficial and it really is not. Um, we need more women in the private sector who are visible in their roles. And I feel as though part of my role at the TPG is being visible, is saying that the chair's a woman, the vice chair's a woman, the financial director's a woman, the director of uh, human resources is a woman, and the director of the legal department is a woman. I mean, all of this means that women from the outside, and particularly young women, look at an organization like this and, think, and they say, I can do that, I can do that. And I think that's important in private industry. I've been absolutely struck by how slow we are in Switzerland. Here we are, Switzerland, you'd think it's one of the most developed countries in the world. I mean, I went to a dinner two years ago of a major economic trade organization in Geneva. We were about 35 people and I was the only woman. This is 
unsustainable. This is absolutely unacceptable. And I, I had a hard time. I had a very hard time. And I told the organizers afterwards that I would no longer participate in something like that. Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. is, I mean, we need visibility. We know all of us, you know, all of us women who are on this call, everyone needs to be out there um, pushing, you know, pushing ourselves, pushing our organizations, pushing our work. But in a way, we are models, you know, we're role models. And that's so important. We can't change the male um, the male model or structure by ourselves. And it's difficult to change it from the outside. But I, I think being visible and meaning, meaning being a model and encouraging, I mean, I've, been, I've done mentoring of women for, for decades. And I think that mm -hmm. is absolutely key to getting more women to apply even to positions in private companies where they will have power as well. So all of that, it sounds, you know, as I say, it sounds cosmetic, but it's really not. It's very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on, on that front, I uh, thank you very much Anne, for saying that. I mean, I was also working for, for almost six years in the private sector. And I have to say, I didn't have the same chances, or I felt I didn't have the same chances as other uh, fellow colleagues who were male. And somehow I had I had the feeling that they were more developed, you know, like, like they had the chances to develop in the, on their, in their career ladder and to climb up several positions. And I think it's uh, you say it's mentorship, super important, but at the same time, giving the opportunity for women to be leaders. I think uh, we need leadership skills. I think this is so super important because if we are, uh, keep the roles of, you know, lagging behind and be behind the scenes all the time, we will never have a, a, a larger share because as you say, we, it's not just about character, it's also about skills and knowledge and many things. And, and um, you are role models, definitely. I'm a, a, young, a young one here, but you are definitely role models uh, that I can look up to. And I think a lot of people in the audience would 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 definitely like to know your your career paths and and I think these these experiences are important to share uh, from soft skills soft skills perspective but also from a, you know from the knowledge perspective in PPP and I think the private sector plays an important role so if we can for instance start now under the web as an initiative where private sector coming back to actionable steps that Geoffrey was mentioning that, that the uh, private sector companies in Geneva or in other, in other countries uh, form a group where we can actually deliver training and skills to women that would be actually amazing. Even investors, you know, investors from an impact invest, investing point of view. Valeska, you are way too modest. You are also a role model. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, I just was um, very interested to get uh, a notion of just uh, how people find themselves uh, in positions uh, such as Anne, you know, what does it take to get there? And I, I always remember uh, the, the uh, very famous uh, South African golfer, Gary Player, and he was said, oh, well, Gary, you're, you've always been in the right place and you're always a bit lucky. And he said, yes, you're absolutely right. I, I, I was very lucky and I practiced mm -hmm. every day, worked very hard to be lucky. And, and I, think, I, I think one, one has to accept that, uh, you know, hard work is the mechanism to get to wherever we actually are. And there's no sort of magic bullets. But I take the visibility issue tremendously important because it gives a, 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 an impetus and enthusiasm and motivation to, to women. And, and, and we had a year or so ago a, a, a meeting where the five heads of the UN regional commissions uh, from, you know, there are five UN regions. We are the one based in Europe, based in Geneva with Olga Alvirova, who's our executive secretary. And she convened all five to come on the platform on public-private partnerships. And that was symbolically a tremendous message to the whole organization and to the organizations throughout the world that women have a leadership role to play and they are doing it extremely well. And I'm afraid to say that UN is an oasis of excellence here. We, we, we can always do better, but we are gender equal in many, many actions now and made tremendous progress. But it's having this symbolic nature of showing that we are doing this that, that can encourage uh, women and, and it's, it's, who have got many, many more difficulties to get to the top. 
So we have a couple of questions coming in from the audience. I would like to give uh, one to Irina uh, that is coming from Bhutan, from Rishin Pemo, who says, my question is, how are the initiatives and arrangements made with FIs in relaxing the collateral requirements for women uh, clients of uh, financial institutions, I imagine? Is there any government intervention in such arrangements? Question mark. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that that was one of the suggestions um, uh, in, um, from, from the survey that came out that these collaterals need to be relaxed a little bit. Um, all these FIs and MDBs and uh, you know, BFIs, they actually work uh, more towards sort of sovereign um, relationships and deals, uh, meaning that in close collaboration with governments. So um, they would actually you know, approach or, you know, from that perspective, see what the projects are aligned uh, with the government's sort of directive and then lend to the government. However, from that perspective, um, it can always be initiated from the private sector side, uh, approached then through the government channels and asked for the loans and then thereafter, you know, because all of these DFIs and FDs also have their own uh, goals, African Development Bank, one of them is the gender, which is one of the high fives that they sort of, um, you know, distinguish between different uh, projects that they need to get involved. Um, so, so, yeah, so I think that they're also working quite high. And also from the instruments, financial instruments point of view, they would have different categories for these types of things where um, actually, you know, um, SMEs and uh, women can actually apply for and therefore, um, you know, executed in such manner. So, so, yeah, so certainly there is in place, uh, but again, you know, the channels can be quite difficult to, you know, it needs to be correctly done and the red tape can be quite big in certain cases. Yeah. Then uh, we have a question from Priscilla Yewunde, the Infrastructure Concession Regulatory Commission, ICRC, it's not the International Red Cross, <laughs> committee in Geneva, so um, is integrating gender in Nigeria's PPPs, and this is ongoing, and we realize the involvement of gender segregated data collection in the project development stage of the PPP life cycle is a little tricky, because government is unable to fund this. Will the multilateral development banks, e.g. African Development Bank, be able to come in at this point? And if so, what strategies are available? This is the stage that is generally non-commercial on the life cycle and is the responsibility of the government, but funding and strategies are required. So the question at the core, if I interpret it right, is how do you measure the social impact in the fabric uh, that comes with these uh, criteria? And um, I don't know who from the panelists would like to take this question. Uh, yes, could I, uh, maybe if, if I could answer this, uh, I think it's a very important question and, and, uh, and speaking on behalf of, of the UN system, we need to engage with the, with the multilateral development banks, sensitize them to the importance of sustainable development goals and women's empowerment in that, uh, that aspect. And, and uh, sadly, I haven't had so many contacts with the African Development Bank, but I have talked with the European Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and, and Development. And what's happening is that they're extremely interested in the Sustainable Development Goals and, and seeing to the extent to which they can mainstream those principles into their lending practices. So much so that we have now, at last, it's taken a few years to develop an evaluation methodology on people first public private partnerships. And this methodology is a tool which can be used by banks in their lending practices. It comes in two, two flavors, if you like. One is the self-assessment tool by which all projects can get uh, sort of in, an indication of the extent to which 
women's empowerment is being uh, you know being um, uh, carried out inside the com inside the project and get a good score as, as a result and also as a recognition scheme whereby through through uh, through uh, evaluators and consultants a project can actually be at different stages of the project at the beginning the middle and also at the operational stage we, we can make a, a a judgment as to whether the project is people first and consistent with the SDGs and we, and in that context whether the project is empowering women sufficiently in the carrying out of, 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 of the of, of the endeavor and, and and these are real practical tools and if they are used by the banks they could the banks themselves can benefit this from re reputational Im improvements too the banks need to demonstrate that they're on the ball with regards to sustainable development and and this is a, a mechanism by doing it they have their own guidance but I'm just saying that doing it through a kind of UN a tool like this it gives a, a, a certain um, emphasis which wouldn't come if they were just doing it through their own offices but um, maybe Irina might want to comment on that yeah sorry I'm just trying to find the comments it seems like it's disappeared off and I couldn't um, properly hear JC it's and the answer it's in the answered ones uh, if you click. Uh -huh, answered the ones sorry exactly yeah um, is that from the lady called Priscilla? Priscilla, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, so, so if we can, so and we realize in warm agenda to data collection, the government to fund this. So I, I'm just this having a segregated. It should be this segregated. Sorry. Yeah. So I'm just uh, a little tricky. What is a little tricky to fund the gender segregated involvement realized? And then I'm, I'm, I'm failing to see what is, you know, what is government not able to fund, basically, in this maybe, question? Maybe it has to do with the monitoring uh, tools, maybe, or the, or the digital instruments they require to gather the data. So I, I, can, I can think of that. So, so I guess, that's where the the government requires yeah, the fund. Okay. No. Yeah. Well, look. I think that uh, um, certainly. I mean, this should form. First of all, it should form part part of the project, I guess. Um, and I don't know. Uh, I don't understand why the governments would not be able to fund this uh, through the various mechanisms. But definitely, if it is a, if it forms part of the project, uh, the MDBs would. Uh, be able to fund it through whatever means, whether it's a loan or a grant or whatever the case might be. So I think that, um, you know, without this information, you wouldn't get to the right sort of stage of what you need to, to go and do further. So I think that as a part of the project, certainly, you know, either MDBs or the governments or whoever should actually leave some sort of a you know, headroom for, for these type of things, and they should be able to fund it or loan the monies for it. So, yeah. That's an important point you're making, Irina, mm. uh, because governments should not be let off the hook easily, especially yeah, exactly. when it comes to such important criteria that have a massive social impact mm. uh, on the life cycle of a public-private partnership. And, they need to be built for the beneficiaries and beneficiaries are both men and women and uh, it's actually proven when uh, the design uh, has been um, also uh, from the architectural uh, co-designed by women uh, that uh, it will serve you know a better a better uh, better outcome at the end hundred mm, percent so um, then let's move on to the next question from Caroline Chema Eric uh, two areas where gender can be adequately addressed is through pushing gender tags and contractual provisions in PPP agreements and also have gender tags in regulatory and legal frameworks for government systems. These should address issues such as equal gender pay, gender-friendly infrastructure planning and implementation, which we just uh, mentioned, uh, labor relations, skills transfer, and a lot of other things. We need a regulated system to make gender sense in PPP. So the suggestion from Caroline is uh, let's make these contracts live 
and use them to achieve uh, the objectives uh, that we give ourselves in these public-private partnerships. Any uh, feedback from the panelists on this proposal? I'd, I'd like to just say one thing about that. Um, I just looked up the B Corps, which are these certified companies all over the world, and there is indeed a gender requirement. So that's a start, that if a company mm -hmm. wants to be certified as a B Corp, a sustainable corporation, they have to have uh, exactly these points, these gender tags that this person has asked about. And I think that's a, a very good first step. You know, it's, uh, there's much more to be done than that, but I think it's a very good point. So thanks for and that. And again, it comes from, from the policy and regulation, you know, that type of thing. It, it trickles down, you know, yeah. um, until we actually realize that we should, we should have them irrespective, you know, irrespective of the policy or, or the regulation as well. Yeah. Uh, we need to be mindful by the time we have five minutes left. So we'll take a couple of uh, questions that we haven't answered so far. Um, and then we'll maybe give a possibility for a final word to the panelists. Um, from Tami Sfindizi, what would a good indicator for one PPP equitable participation be? Any, well, I think in, in, uh, in Irina's um, expose, there were a couple of very good leads, how to, how to you know, what attack angle to take uh, to implement such uh, such uh, indicators? Do you want to maybe develop on that, Irina, or say um, where, where where resources are, where where more information can be found on this? Maybe with the African Development Bank. Yeah, well, I do, I'm not. Look, I don't think that again. You know, there is a certain sort of spectrum or the bottom and the top line. Um, I can only maybe speak from the point of South Africa in a sense that, um, as you know, we have a, a sort of, you know, a policy requirement with the black economic empowerment. So if, you t if we take that as an example, as a previous sort of, you know, or historic type of thing where we can uh, see what these measures are, um, in these type of examples, for example, 30% of the local material, including the labor, and needs to be a B compliant, which is black economic empowerment, must be and should be included in all the projects. So if you take a look at these type of examples, you can then build on sort of, you know, a good indicators or, you know, what is the equitable type of a thing in the participation. But again, you know, it doesn't, you know, it, it all depends on how strong the countries, the policies, these reforms, and how actually willing you are to transform this sector. So, you know, in, in there's not good and bad, you know, even as, like, if you didn't have anything before, even a 1% is a movement in the right direction, I would say. So whatever it is, it's, yeah, it's, it, it's always good to have in, in that type of thing. I don't know if Anne or Maud have, any sort of views on that as well? Can I say? Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. And yeah. also, um, or just to complement on that, uh, for for the question, like if, like if the audience wants to look at McKinsey indicators for on gender gap, they actually offer a list of fifteen indicators uh, with um, in in key ca categorizations. You know, like. Uh, equality in work, essential services, enablers of economic opportunity, what I, what I mentioned. So, so, so that would be also a good example. Uh, I see Maud as well on the screen, so maybe she also has uh, useful insights on that. And I have a, a sound, my sound was cutting a bit, so I don't know if you can hear me, but um, no, I just uh, completely align with what Anne and Irina um, said before, and I think, um, we, we know now, we, I think we have the tools, we have a couple of examples of how and policymakers can actually implement in the legislation a, a couple of measures to um, push for uh, more equity, um, gender, uh, in, 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 class, in infrastructure, more, more in the infrastructure space. And we have now 
sufficient examples around the world, sufficient case studies. Uh, it's just now really to back to government, also to the private sector. I completely agree with Geoffrey because, um, of course, lenders, MDBs, um, equity investors, and they're now more and more implement actually uh, SDGs in their requirements to loan, to lend actually uh, in the loan. So it's it's really, and, and, and specifically ESGs, and in the ESGs you have component um, around, of course, uh, not, not only sustainable, but also including um, uh, uh, more inclusivity in, in different areas. So I guess um, it's, it's, it's a bit that, uh, <laughs> just have to, 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 to do now and to implement all these measures. So a lot of willingness in, in the uh, government side um, to actually uh, push and especially in developing countries because um, I, I'm sure that I, I, I agree with Anne when you said that even in major country and de developed country, uh, there is not enough for visibility of women. That's completely right. But um, in developing uh, country even less. So that's that's right that um, now um, I think MDBs are, are a very, very important role to play because MDBs are here in developing countries to help actually um, uh, the, 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 to help, um, sorry, for, for, the, for the last step for the uh, on the financial structure in the infrastructure deals. Um, so, so here MDBs mm -hmm. are uh, here to mitigate, are here to, to lend and to loan and to also help with the um, policy side with um, for, for the, those governments. So um, uh, again, the African Development Bank, Asian Development IDB um, are doing a lot already. Of course, the World Bank are doing a lot, uh, but um, and government um, should be even um, do more um, align with the private sector because if the private sector um, at some point doesn't want to um, to lend money, um, the project will just not gonna happen. So if, if if in the loans there is some conditions CPs that just include uh, more inclusivity requirements, that will be just uh, a, a big step, I think, in the right direction. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We have a last question from Didi Ganawan who says, "Good afternoon." Uh, I am Daddy from Indonesia. We have been working on civil society engagement related issues in road projects. We allow the people involved in the project from the beginning, at least by involving women and uh, people with disabilities and indigenous uh, people in public consultation during feasibility study, design and land acquisition and construction. I think uh, there's nothing to add to this. It's a, it's a good practice and uh, I just would like to refer to the framework for inclusive infrastructure, which Mo has pre presented to us with Rio. Uh, so there are frameworks around, um, and uh, we're happy uh, if we've been able to facilitate the discussion today to develop these strategies and how to have more gender balanced uh, PPP projects. Um, we are now going to finish our webinar and I would like each panelist to maybe say one or two sentences uh, on their take. Please Anne, maybe you can start. Okay, um, just to sum up, I think that we're, uh, COVID has changed the world and we've all seen that and I think we have to take advantage of that now and push for real change, whether it's public or private on every project, I think we should demand change. I think that's very important. And uh, all of everything we've discussed is helpful. But if we put it all together, it will work. It will work. So that's my conclusion. Thanks. Valeska, maybe you want to go next? Yeah, I, I want to say that gender inclusion is a must. And it's a must for governments uh, and also for, for the private sector, even the civil society and academia. Um, I would just like to close this by saying that I would, I'm very happy to be a champion to promote women empowerment, especially the young ones. So uh, if among the audience or within your organizations, uh, you, you feel there's a need for this, I'm very happy to champion this and help close the gender gap using the existing frameworks and hopefully uh, use actual data to monitor progress. 
and the SDG and yes. gender inclusion. Thank you. Yes, just um, uh -huh. again saying that um, yeah, gender inclusivity is really um, very, very, very important and we have now all the tools, frameworks to make it happen. So, um, uh, COVID-19 uh, in, in a lot of countries and especially in developing countries um, have been uh, sometimes uh, taking step back for women. And so we have to be even more vigilant uh, to help and to assist those countries among, um, uh, policies to help them uh, protect uh, the more fragile uh, population and yes every visibility of women uh, should all the time uh, be uh, something that um, and is very helpful for for the women uh, to, to to step up and um, thank you yeah. yeah thank you so uh, first of all thank you so much for this fantastic webinar i enjoyed it thoroughly and with the co-panelists it was an absolute pleasure um, I don't have anything anymore to add. They've said it all. I guess just from my perspective is that, you know, uh, being a woman, um, I think that we need to, first of all, advocate for each other, support each other, and also involve uh, our counter counterparts, men, who you know, strongly support us in this, and just take it forward from now and, and make it happen. This is it. it, it there's no way otherwise. So yes. thank you, JC, for this fantastic opportunity as well. Thank you. Geoffrey. And Beth as well. Thanks. Thank you, Irina. Uh, Geoffrey, would you like to say something? Yes, as always, I'm, I'm sort of wondering at what level of ambition. Should we keep to the top, top ambition or should we just keep reduced and be a little bit more modest? No, no, I keep going up at the top. And I, I think where there is a gap, John Christophe, is between the UN and the multilateral development banks. The UN needs uh, to give its, I mean, there is the Equator principles, which are done for environment, where the banks take on certain obligations, but so far nothing on women's empowerment. So maybe this is an idea to actually try and make a bridge between the UN and its voluminous uh, discussion on women's empowerment and the, the banks uh, and trying to get them uh, to try and in, include women's uh, empowerment issues in their lending practices. And maybe the G20 and maybe uh, the Global Infrastructure Hub in Sydney could play a role in bringing the UN and the multi multilateral development banks together. There's a concrete idea, but also what to carry on this discussion. Very, very important, Jean-Christophe, and excellent work that you are doing in your capacity. This is, this is to, to your great credit, so please carry on in this work. Well, I would like to thank our great panelists and our exceptional moderator uh, for having spent quality time with us today. Uh, we're impressed by the number of participants who have joined this web webinar. We thank you to have taken the time to participate and for the interesting questions that were addressed uh, to our exceptional panelists. I believe everybody has found uh, answers today. Uh, we will shortly publish a short summary of today's webinar on the web website. And if you would like to stay posted on the latest development in public private partnerships, you may want to follow our web's LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube presence. We invite you to share uh, your PPP-specific updates on the web blog. It's built for us PPP professionals, and especially also for young and for women PPP professionals. Uh, because we think it's important to have that diversity out there. And um, we invite you to also become a member of WAP and join the family and uh, contribute to our weekly newsletter, the PPP Times. If you want to be uh, proactive, uh, simply raise your questions. We're there for you uh, as PPP professionals to shape the profession and have the voice of the PPP professions out there. Thank you very much. And this concludes our webinar for today. Bye-bye.